This world will tell you to keep your distress in sealed letters of lips behind shiny white envelopes that no one need read. They will stamp it with a diagnosis, label your suffering an illness. They will call it depression, while you call it the natural effect of oppression. They will feed you pills to cure social ills, medicate injustice, they will name the imbalance of power in society a chemical imbalance in your brain. They will refuse to understand the causes of your pain. They will attempt to colonize the earth of your mind with language your mother tongue cannot swallow. And you will be lost in translation, searching for Urdu subtitles so that your grandmother might understand. As they offer terms like anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, and you will wonder what this apparently ordered way of living is. A filing away of feelings into categories of cabinets that cannot be contained. But you must remember that this feeling is not a sickness. But you must remember that they once called homosexuality an illness of the mind. Remember that there was a time that they once labelled runaway slaves as mentally ill for desiring freedom. Remember that they still deem psychosis as a black disease. So please remember and keep feeling. Keep feeling. Cry on the tube in front of passing strangers. Wear the cuts on your thighs like beautifully inked tattoos. Put your sadness on like it is the silkiest shirt in your wardrobe. Two-step with the grief anchored to your feet like they're your freshest pair of Air Force Ones. So let your tears fall in protest. Release your rage in revolution to a world that is terrified of unfiltered and unedited truth. Do not dilute your heart. Gather community around the table so you can feast in this feeling. Let their sorrow and joy be a convoy to ride together out of this societal warfare. Show them that your tenderness packs muscle, that this tenderness is shared, that this suffering is to be understood at the collective, not only the individual perspective. There is healing to be found in our community. Phenomenal woman, I am in love with your tenderness. I am in love with our tenderness. So please, stay tender. Stay tender. Hi everyone, thank you so much um, for being here with me today and thank you so much Suman for inviting me to do this. It's a real honour to share space with like one of my biggest academic heroes. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today um, about whiteness in clinical psychology. So I'm a recently qualified clinical psychologist but I've also got a lot of my own lived experiences of using services, especially in my early life. Um, I want you guys today to try and get you know, to try and leave here with an understanding of what whiteness means, what whiteness in clinical psychology looks like, a bit about my research findings, which is in clinical psychology, and also some ideas for dismantling the master's house of clinical psychology. So just before we start, I want to offer an invitation to everyone to, to just come into the body, um, to maybe just notice your feet on the floor, the weight of your body on the chair underneath you, maybe your breath filling your lungs. And I think with this, you know, this topic, we can often engage with it at a very intellectual level. And whiteness and systems of oppression can really demand disembodiment. So I just invite you today to notice what comes up in your body and any discomfort that might be coming up. So the reason I wanted to share that poem and share some poetry with you is for me, it offers a segue really into Audre Lorde's work. And she says, you know, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. For me, poetry is not one of those master's tools. Um, it really 
it speaks to and allows us to author and, and, and gain knowledge of black and brown life outside of what is scholared and deemed as legitimate by spaces of academia. And with, with that in mind, I'm going to go on to talk to you today about my research in clinical psychology. And research may be understood by some as, as one of those master's tools. But I invite you to go on this journey of thinking with me today about dismantling the house of clinical psychology with a curious approach to some of those tools. So maybe the psychological theories that are used um, or psychological references. So yeah, just to keep that in mind. Um, these two, these things too, have a recursive relationship with whiteness. And what do I mean by whiteness? Suman talked about whiteness as power, you know, whiteness as the systemic rules, norms, and discourses that produce and reproduce the dominance of those socially racialized as white. It's often invisible to its benefactors, yet remains an oppressive reality to people of global majority. Whiteness, systemic whiteness, is not synonymous with white people you know, who are not a homogenous group, but people of the global majority are also capable of reinforcing whiteness. I use this term um, because I think terms like BAME can offer sense of whiteness by default. So it's just trying something different. Um, so my research, I'm interested in looking at clinical psychology in the UK, which currently is 88% white and 80% female. So the dominant group there are white middle-class female psychologists. And I wanted to hold up the mirror to understand their experience and their sense making of whiteness in the profession. Why am I centering those who are already centered? Well, it was a conscious effort really to shift the unexamined gaze, you know, for the researcher to become the researcher, and particularly within clinical psychology today. There is no UK research that's doing that. Um, often the lens is put upon those who are different. So I was interested in understanding how white British female clinical psychologists understand whiteness, how whiteness might influence their clinical work, and also how whiteness might influence the profession of clinical psychology. These are people who self-identified as white British. So I just want to acknowledge, you know, that the experience of identifying as white other or white passing may be very, very different for people, their relationship with whiteness. Before I go into the findings of the research, just want to share some context of clinical psychology today. It's been described as white psychology for white folk. Why is it so white, the profession? Well, it's incredibly inaccessible. Um, you know, I can speak from personal experience for this. It took me five years to even get my door in for the interview, get my foot in the door. Um, it really values further education, which isn't necessarily accessible for people who don't have the financial resource to do this. Um, there's a real emphasis on having lots and lots of clinical experience, which is often very low paid and often free and voluntary. And how are currently the profession addressing this? Well, they're rolling out widening access initiatives, which basically use mentors to skill up um, people of the global majority to get them into the profession. So underpinning that is this, this assumption that there's a deficit, um, rather than actually addressing the systemic barriers in a very inaccessible profession. What else? I mean, the, the profession tries to justify itself as an objective science, you know, to make itself justifiable alongside psychiatry. It's got a history of colonialism and eugenics behind it. How does it try to do this, become this like scientist practitioner profession? Well, it draws on having a scientific evidence base. This evidence base is made up of research using weird populations. Weird stands for Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, democratic populations, which only actually make up 5% of the global population. This evidence base and research then goes on to form NICE guidelines, right? They inform NICE guidelines, which decide which psychological therapies get rolled across the NHS. And these therapies are often grounded in individualism. So cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, you know, is very much locating distress within the individual psyche and and recovery and coping me mechanisms are also placed upon the responsibility of the individual and and what that does is it obscures racial trauma political trauma and also within that is this pathologizing of racial trauma there's also a real emphasis on recovery you know get get well be better what does well look like what is this cured state you know there's a real movement away from being with our suffering and finally, finally, I think a very overt and obvious expression of racism and within the profession is this slave auction that was reenacted um, within a Liverpool trainers conference very recently, which had huge, huge impacts across black trainees across the country. 
So just, just coming back to that, that reference to racial trauma being pathologized, I wanted to share this quote with you, which I think is really powerful. And maybe we can think about it in the context of how black men's distress is understood and often pathologized and perceived as dangerous. So trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. Trauma in a people looks like culture. So I'm gonna just go on now to, to just say a little bit about what white psychologists make of this. You know, what were their experience of whiteness in clinical psychology? Well, actually, they were, generally speaking, very aware. I just want to say I only spoke to nine, so this is a real snapshot um, into the profession. But they were, generally speaking, quite aware of the issues. But alongside that was a real sense of complicity with whiteness in the profession. So I'm going to go on to share some quotes underneath the themes that came up. So they're aware of, you know, the profession being very white. So here, this first quote speaks to... Oh, you know, I want the profession to be diverse, but actually there's this investment in upholding the status quo. I don't want it to happen at the expense of good psychologists, good white psychologists. And then she goes on to talk here about how blackness is rewarded and a benefit to be able to get into this inaccessible profession, which isn't the case at all. So just going on here now to speak about how this psychologist really, and, and this theme I think captures racialization, particularly within the therapy room and broader within mental health services. But this first psychologist was speaking to her awareness that being racialized as white was a barrier in the therapeutic relationship. You know, she couldn't understand or be with the experiences of racial trauma with the young girl she was working with. She wishes here, she says, I wish I could be back black right now and give you a different experience. And then going on to, this, this quote on this slide, the second quote here, is speaking to racialization really impacting risk assessment processes and referral processes to safeguarding, where the liberties of families from a, people from a global majority are significantly affected. And there's a, an awareness of it, but again, what this, I think this highlights is there's no mention of advocacy, there's no mention of intervention, just an awareness of these issues and perhaps speaks to some complicity. And then finally here, this last theme, we don't see ourselves as white. It speaks to psychologists' awareness of the invisibility of whiteness within the profession. We don't see ourselves as white, do we really? And here, we need to do more and a highlighted need for further action. So within my paper, which I'll put in the chat afterwards for you guys, you're very welcome to read more. I speak a bit more about the psychological theories that might be underpinning some of these processes potentially. So for example, white psychologists having to confront the de-idealized self being an incredibly uncomfortable process. So, you know, how this discomfort is enacted is in these forms of violent complicity, silence, denial, avoidance. These are some examples, but I go in a lot more detail in the paper rather than here. Um, so just staying with that final quote, we need to do more. Doing very much be, being a verb. And I wanted to link that to Bell Hooks' work. You know, her, she always talks about love being a verb and an action. So what might loving change look like? What might doing change look like? The, the structures behind the structural shifts need to happen to support individual psychologists to do this work. What does that look like? Well, anti-racism needs to be a core competency rather than this optional effective exercise. You know, th there needs to be a real change within the curriculum, teaching, as well as assessment to even get the qualification of becoming a clinical psychologist. The way that reflexivity is assessed and operationalized, we can do the same with anti-racism as a practice. And it needs to go beyond just the diversification of, of bodies, though representation does matter. You know, we don't just want to be seeing white lecturers teaching reading lists that, with, that are abundant with white authors. There needs to be a change in recruitment practices for this to shift. How might this happen? Well, shortlisting criteria could shift so that instead of inaccessible, you know, um, clinical and academic experience being valued, lived experiences of oppression, lived experiences could be valued. In terms of the individual shifts, you know, just coming back to the body again, you know, how much of this is about the discomfort in the body, 
centering the discomfort in the body and being able to be with that, getting uncomfortable, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. So centering the narrowing throat and tightening chest and coming back to that as a place for opening for change. And using power as clinical psychologists to empower. So what does advocacy in the therapy room and beyond look like? How can we challenge risk culture? This idea that black people and people of low maturity are, are risky. So, for, you know, I can share a story for, for me. I was working in, in homelessness for the last year um, with a black man who, was, his expressions of distress were very regularly interpreted as risky and potentially harmful, especially when, whenever he expressed any suicidal risk and the police were often called. Um, and part of the work was really working alongside the team to think about how else we could understand these expressions of distress without being coming in a very reactive place and also without contact with the police who he had extreme histories of harm with. So how could we actually use the team to support him in those times of distress? And also stepping off from this cover of being the neutral blank slate therapist who, who doesn't engage in any, any social justice informed practice. I think we can often use that as a bit of a veil to hide behind. You know, in terms of clinical decision making, psychologists are often very thoughtful when it comes to gender depression. You know, we'll think about a woman with a history of sexual trauma, you know, and not being necessarily a safe place for her to go into a therapeutic space with nine other men. Is, is that same thoughtfulness applied to thinking about therapeutic spaces, you know, with people of a global majority with huge amounts of extensive racial trauma? And finally, you know, just taking off my psychologist hat a bit, and, and this speaks to the poem that I shared in the beginning, what, is, what can we do outside of services? You know, this huge reliance on services. I think sometimes there's a movement away from being able to be with both our own and each other's expressions of suffering. You know, services aren't the only solution to do that. How can we better embrace each other's madness, madnesses and be with each other's distress and our own? So I hope I haven't like flied, just flown through that super quickly. I just wanted to leave you with a couple of questions to reflect on, either with yourself or with others. Um, this tool is actually something that I really, really appreciate from Adrienne Marie Brown. She often uses this, you know, offering questions to reflect on. What are your non-conventional mediums and places of study and sharing knowledge? How do you avoid being with your own suffering and the suffering of others? How do you engage your body in therapeutic and life spaces, you know? What, and what are your collective spaces of healing? Healing doesn't occur in isolation. How are you coming together with people, whether that's through cooking and spending time with family, what are your collective spaces of healing? So just, just encouraging you to reflect on that. And yeah, I just wanted to end today with a final invitation to return to your body, to come back to your, to your feet on the floor, the feeling of your feet on the floor the weight of your body on the chair beneath you, maybe your breath moving through your body, and just notice any discomfort that might have come up today. And just, yeah, I just wanna leave you with this last quote, you know, being with the narrowing throat and the tightening chest as a place of opening for change. Thank you. I, I, I had this last um, James Baldwin quote, but maybe I can, I think it's a bit long and I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. So I, I think, um, you know, I can put, point you guys towards it, but I would just really strongly recommend this, this essay, um, the seminal essay, The Fire Next Time, um, which speaks to, to some of the things that I've been talking about in terms of awareness. Thank you so much.